Hello. Gonna go over some more matter and algebra. This time part two we're gonna be talking about subgroups. And remember last time we talked about groups. So what does it mean to be a subgroup? Well it's gotta be closed under the group's operation. And it's gotta be a group in its own right. And we remember what that means. It needs to be associative, have an identity, and each el each element has to have an inverse and it's set. So, take a quick and easy example. So the complex numbers under addition, that's the group. Now are the reals under addition a subgroup? And how about the rationals and the integers? Well, the reals, are they closed under addition? When we, when we add two real numbers together, do we get a real number? We do, right? And is it, are the reals under addition a group in its own right? They are. And I think we proved that in our last video. Because they have an identity, which is zero. You add any number to a real number and you get zero. Or you get you get you get the uh number. For instance three plus zero, that's three. That's the that's the original number. Each element has an inverse. So for three it would be negative three because those are the two numbers that you add together to get the identity. Again, just rehashing. Now why don't we need to prove associativity for subgroups? Well, if we're talking about a subset of a group that's of a group, well we know a group by definition is associative. So do we really need to prove that the subset is, a pro is associative? We don't. And I hope that makes sense. Let me know if it doesn't. So the reals, subgroup of the complex numbers under addition, and the rationals and, and the integers, it's going to be the same thing for addition. And you can show that for yourself if you'd like. But now let's talk about multiplication. And we're not going to talk, we're, we're going to exclude zero. And that's because of the following. The reals, the identity for multiplication is 1. That's the number that you multiply by any number to get that same, to get that original number, right? And the inverse is 1 over that number. For instance, the, the uh, inverse of 1 over 7, of, or of 7, is 1 over 7, right? And vice versa. The inverse of 1 over 7 is 7. Those are the two numbers. Those are the that's the number that you multiply it by to get the identity. Seven times one over seven, that's the identity. That's one. But why do we exclude zero? Well what's the inverse of zero? What number can you multiply zero by to get the identity? You can't you can't multiply zero by any number to get one. So for multiplication, we exclude zero. Now, how about the rationals? Works the same way. You can show that for yourself. But how about the integers? It's a little bit different. It's not, but why? What's the inverse of 5? What's the multiplicative inverse of 5? One fifth, right? Now is one fifth an, in an integer? It's not, right? So when we're talking about having an inverse, that inverse needs to be in our set. So the integers are not a subgroup of the complex numbers under multiplication. So the reason's inverses. Good on the other two, though. All right, so let's talk about an example. If H and K are subgroups of an abelian group G, all my examples have to do with abelian groups because I just like saying that, then this subset we have, which is H times K, and L, where H is an element in H and K is an element of K, is a subgroup. So we need to show that it's a subgroup of K, of G. So we have to work with H and K are subgroups.
and we just talked about what that means to be a subgroup. It means that they're they're uh, they're closed, and they are groups in their own right. In other words, they all have inverses in the groups. They all have the identity in the groups and so forth. And they're abelian as well. So we have all that stuff to work with. So let's just set up H and K are subgroups of the group. So we're going to take two elements in our subset. And our subset, these two elements are going to look like an element times H, an element of H times an element of K. So we take two elements. And we need to show that it's closed. So when we multiply those two elements together, just like before, we can regroup and we can flip because remember, it's an abelian group. So we can switch that A2 and K1. And then we can regroup again and notice that this is in our subset. H1, H2 times K1, K2 is in our subset. Since H1, H2 is in H and K1, K2 is in K. If you look at our at our definition of our subset, it's an element of H times an element of K. So I hope you see that. If you don't, just uh, leave a comment and I'll try to explain further. And the reason by the way that we know H1, H2 is in H is because we know H is a subgroup of G. In other words, we know it's a group, so we know it's closed. And if we know something is closed, we know that when we multiply two elements in that set, we get another element in that set. So H1, H2 is going to be an H. Same with K1 and K2. So, we're good on closed. Let's move on to showing that it's a group in its own right. So the identity is E and we in that is an element of H times an element of K. Right? Since we know H and K are subgroups, we know that the identity is in both of those groups. And for inverses, we're going to claim that the inverse of an element H1, K1 is the inverse H1, the inverse of H1 times the inverse of K1. So we, we're going to show that when we multiply H1, K1 times this inverse that we think what we think is the inverse, we should get the identity, right? That's the definition of an inverse. So what we have is H1, K1 times what we think is the inverse. And like the trick you've seen a million times by now, actually you've probably seen it a billion times. And uh, so we just switch the second two and then we regroup. And just to point out, just to rehash, I mean, I, I know I've talked about this a lot, but just to beat a dead horse here, why did K1 and K1 inverse disappear? Well, K1 times K, K1 inverse, that's when you multiply an element times its inverse, you get the identity. And the identity times anything is at anything. So in the parentheses, you're just left with the inverse of H1. And again, when you multiply those two together, you get the identity. So we've shown that it is the inverse. H1 inverse K1 inverse is the inverse because when you multiply it with the original element, you get the identity. So we're good on both of those. So it's a subgroup of G. Big check mark. Okay, now we got another interesting example. We got another abelian group. And this time we have a subset and it's 
the special quality about the subset is that whenever you square an element, in other words, whenever you multiply an element by itself, you get the identity. x squared is e. And we got to show that, that it's a subgroup. It forms a subgroup of g. Okay. So just boring setup part time. Let g be an abelian group. Yada yada yada. H is a subset of G. And we're going to take two elements in, in our subset. And we need to show that it's closed, it has an identity, and each element has an inverse. So first part, we've got to show that it's closed, right? So we take those two elements, A and B, and this is interesting. It may take your brain just a couple minutes to wrap its mind around this, but it's it's really interesting, just if you're learning it for the first time. Basically, the quality about this subset is that whenever you square an element, you get the identity. So a squared is e, and also b squared is e. That's by definition for elements in our subset. And we're needing to show that it's closed. Well, what does closed mean? It means when you multiply two elements in a subset, you get another element in that subset. So a, b would be our that element, right? And we need, if we need to show that it's in the subset, then we need to show that a, b squared is e. We need to show that it satisfies that criteria for our subset. We need to show that a, b squared is e. That's a, we need, we're needing to show that it satisfies the criteria of x squared equals e. So just think about that a little bit. It, it's, it's really interesting, and it makes sense after just a little while. You just need to, your brain needs time to process. So we start out with AB squared, and the proof is actually really easy. It's just figuring out what you're needing to show. So AB squared is AB times AB. Regroup. Flip it up. You've seen this a billion times by now. and regroup again and notice that what we end up with is a squared times b squared which by our definition those are both e and when we multiply those together we of course get e so we've shown that a b squared is in e we've shown that when you multiply two elements in a set in the set together they satisfy the criteria of our subset A little bit late here. So it's closed. So now let's show that the identity is in our subset. Well, the identity is e, and e squared is e times e, which is e. So of course that's going to be in our in our subset. It's going to satisfy that criteria that x squared should be e. For inverses, notice that, again, the criteria for our subset is that x squared should be e. And notice the definition of inverses. x times its inverse should be e. Do you see the similarity between these two equations? You see that x is actually x inverse. Do you see that? So x is its own inverse. So if we're trying to show that the inverse also is in the set, well of course it's in our set because it's, it's itself. So if x is in the set, and x is the inverse of x, then the inverse is in our set. So we're good on inverses, and we're also good on the identity. So h is not only a subset of, it, of g, it's a subgroup of g. Big check mark. And that's all for today. See you next time. Leave comments questions, feedback, very welcome, thanks.